Hello, you are uh, one of my first guests with really strange names. So is your name Mr. Dr. Deprecator or just Deprecator? <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Deprecator is sufficient. Thank you. Ah, uh, Dr. I guess Deprecator. In, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess in, um, uh, I guess, I guess in Germany, it would be like uh, Herr Doctor Deprecator. Yeah, exactly. Because so, um, I, and I was never sure whether you are the doctor or just the Mister Deprecator. So this was uh, this was oh. the question. Okay, but your real name is Stuart Marx, right? That's right. Okay, perfect. Of course. And um, so then, Mister Deprecator. Oh, sorry, Mister Doctor Deprecator. What was your first computer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my first computer. Uh, all right. So I, you know, it. I, I was thinking about the the the, the right uh, the right way to answer this, and I I would say the first the my first computer I'd say the first computer that I actually did significant amount of programming on, mm -hmm. uh, even though I didn't own it, I never owned one of these. Was a Wang twenty two hundred uh, basic interpretive basic computer. Um, I don't know if anybody you or any of your listeners remember Wang Laboratories. No, they were pretty big in the '60s and '70s. Uh, I think they were most famous for uh, word processing machines in the late '70s. Wang, you say? Uh, you said ha, ha. Wang Laboratories. W A N G. W. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, probably in Chinese it would be Wang, but but in you know in the United States everybody looks at that word and says Wang. So Wang. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. So. Um. In. Uh, Probably the last 15 years of, of his career, my father worked for Wang Laboratories okay. as uh, kind of switching between uh, programming and uh, sales. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Wang 2200 was an interpretive basic uh, computer that it was not it would it, it was not a personal computer, but it was small enough to be portable. And so you could, you know, it had a, a keyboard, a CRT display and a processing unit. Mm -hmm. And you could, they were all cabled together. And so you could take it apart and put it into the trunk of your car. Mm -hmm. And so he would do that. If he need, if he had a project to work on, he would, he would uh, carry it out to his car, drive it home and spend the weekend programming. And so I ended up programming that computer as well. So I take a look at now um, Wikipedia on Wang 2200. I never saw them before. So I was not aware mm -hmm. there's such a thing. So um Interesting. So most of my guests are boring, you know. They they start with C sixty four or 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 Spectrum, but Wang, this is a thing, I would say. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, Wang was a big phenomenon, and uh, you know, for it was it was one of these it was one of these things in the in the tech uh, in the tech industry that uh, it it burned brightly for uh, uh, for a few years and then faded out very quickly as well. But uh, the founder of the company, um, um, Chinese immigrant named uh, An Wang, mm -hmm. uh, founded the company, and he was an inventor or one of the co-inventors of core memory. Okay. And so he, uh, I think he, uh, um, anyway, so he founded an electronics company based on that. Uh, they, uh, in the early 60s, developed a line of calculators, um, eventually moving into these uh, um more sophisticated programmable calculators. There was desk, desktop calculators, not handhelds. This was before handhelds. Um, and eventually they did uh, these basic computers, moved into word processors and mini computers, and they were just killed by the introduction of PC in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And that just, that just tanked their business. And over the, over the 1980s, they spent, uh, they spent a lot of time in the 1980s going bankrupt. Okay. So, so that was, that was that. And, and yeah, I guess most people have not heard of them. No. Uh, how, how old were you back then? Um, boy, uh, you know, I don't remember. So, uh, roughly, I, I mean, uh, roughly maybe, maybe 10 or okay. maybe a little bit earlier. Okay. And, and yeah. you started programming immediately or what you did with the wank? Well, it was mostly games, but actually it was pretty cool because, you know, it was an interpretive basic. And so you could type stuff and stuff would happen. And boy, you know, it's kind of amazing. I just picked it up. Yeah, but um, I mean, I, I also started you know, with basic, and 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 nothing happened. You know, I picked basic, tried to do something with it, and and nothing worked. So um, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you know, just saying that you picked it and it worked. So it's amazing. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I don't remember. I don't remember actually much of the the act of learning. Um, well, part of it was I, I had a couple older brothers, and one of my older brothers did a lot of programming himself. Okay, and. 
uh, he, you know, he helped me out and stuff. Okay. Um, but also it was, you know, it was interpretive basic. And so everything was source code, mm -hmm. not like, and, and so since it was source code, I mean, we didn't call it open source then, mm -hmm. but, uh, people would trade, uh, trade programs. And, yep. um, uh, since I was a little kid, I liked games and there were lots of games floating around. And so I collected games. Um, at the same time, there was, um, uh, there was, I guess there was a computer hobbyist industry at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, there was a book by David all a H L, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh 100, 101 basic computer games. Huh. And it was for different computers, but I got my hands on a copy of that book and it's like, wow, oh, look at all these games. Right. And so what, you know, they were printouts. And so you had to type them in. Uh -huh. So that's what I did. So I typed them in and played them. And then it's sort of, well, I, gee, if this is pretty cool, if I change this line, it can change the behavior of the program. Okay. So I changed the behavior of the game. And so, so that's, that's one of the things I spent a lot of time doing on. Okay. So what, what happened after the Wang era? <laughs> well, I guess, I don't know. So I went off to, uh, went off to college, studied, uh, in electrical engineering and computer science. Uh huh. Um, did, uh, did a standard, uh, standard curriculum, um, uh, learned Pascal and then eventually C. Um, it's interesting in, in, in re retrospect, I think people, people dump a lot on Pascal and they're definitely, uh, they're definitely some, some, some irritating things about Pascal. Um, but coming from basic, uh, Pascal was, um, was, was a real eye opener because in basic, right? So you could basic, you know, the, the early basics, you could say, if, you know, if some condition, then line number, and that was all you could do. All you could do was branch. Right. And so the early basics, basics didn't even have an else. <laughs> right. And so you, you, you know, you had, if you wanted to do, if you do wanted to do the equivalent of if, you know, if else, then you had to put go to's and, you know, keep track of where line numbers were and stuff like that. And that was kind of a pain. Yeah. Two patterns. Uh, One, first pattern was, you know, you had to use, you know, the, uh, the line numbers had to be, you know, in 10 steps. So you can yeah. put enough stuff between. And right. there was goes up. You remember goes up? Yes. Uh huh. So uh, interesting. Yeah, goes up. Uh, was it available on the Wank already? Goes. Yeah, I'm trying to remember that that version that that dialect of basic. I think the early basics you could only put a line number. I think the later ones you could put one statement in an if, mm -hmm. which was was really cool. You didn't have to write some go tos. Uh, on the other hand, if you wanted to put two statements. Then you had to do the go to thing. Maybe I, yeah. I remember it incorrectly, but go sub. What it meant is it 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 went to the line and then came back. Right. Yeah. That's exactly what it would do. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, perfect. you said go sub. You know, you go sub eight hundred thirty, and okay. it would it would branch the line eight thirty and keep the return. It would essentially keep the return address on a stack. Although I, well, it would keep. It, excuse me. I don't know if it was on a stack. It would keep the return address somewhere. Yeah. And I don't think we even thought of recursive routine, routines uh, at the time. But yeah, at the end, you know, you could have a succession of lines and say return, mm -hmm. and then it would go back to to wherever it was called from. So that's what I um, remember. Yeah, yeah. But but it's also interesting. I remember the Wang, um, the Wang Basic. They had a variation of Go Sub that would allow you to pass parameters. Uh huh. And I didn't know how to use that at the time. And then later on, I figured out how to use it. And then it was sort of okay. Now I can pass parameters, but I, I need a I need a return value and there there was no return value. Okay, and then pa pa and so, Pascal came in, right? Well, you, I mean, yeah, and this was well, right? I mean, you know, in learning basic, exactly, right? So, 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 what did you do in basic? It's like, okay, well, this subroutine stores its return value in some well-known global variable, and that was always a pain because you had to keep track of that. But, yeah, exactly. Uh, global variables. I forgot about that. This is how we where we, where we store the state. Oh yeah, yeah, right. So. so for, Anyway, coming from that environment, Pascal was a breath of fresh air because you could say, if condition, then begin and write as much as you want, else write as much as you want, end. Yeah. And that was, that was really cool. You didn't have to do go to's. Yeah. Uh, and, and you could, instead of having all these variables that you had to keep track of, you know, the relationships between them, you could create a record and you could group the interesting data together mm -hmm. and treat it all at once. And, and it's interesting because when we were discussing the, the, the recent Java, uh, Java language feature of records, mm -hmm. you know, 
we kicked around a bunch of names and record is it's the same concept as in Pascal. Okay. It's, you know, that that's basically what it is. <laughs> so th- th- then we could even get in some time, you know, goes up with parameters in Java, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because up. go to is already reserved third, as I remember, right? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Maybe we should add a go sub. Uh, go keyword. sub as well. This, this would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you are the first who actually um, mentioned that um, um, Pascal has a bad rep. Actually, I only heard p- positive things uh, about uh, Pascal. Oh. Well, it's interesting because, uh, so I forget, it was one of the C, it, anyway, so so in the first few years of my college career, mm-hmm. um, we did a lot of Pascal programming, mm-hmm. and we spent a lot of time working against the idiosyncrasies of the language. Okay. And what was interesting was we were actually fairly aware of them at the time. And one of them was if you had, um, how did this go? If you, if, if you had a compound Boolean expression, you know, A and B, mm-hmm. right? Now in C and in Java, uh, basically that's a conditional and. So it evaluates A, and if mm-hmm. A is false, then it doesn't bother to evaluate B. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, why would you ever need that? Well, in practical programming, you really do need it, right? And a classic one is... Is if you're if you're indexing through an array or something like that, you you do the bounds check first, and if you are within bounds, then you also check to see if this is the array element you're looking for, and then mm-hmm. break out of the loop or something like that. And um, Pascal did not have that. Okay. Uh, Pascal's rules were it was either undefined, the evaluation was undefined, or it was required that if you said A and B, that it would evaluate both A and B before you know, anding the results together. And so, you know, this if you're is indexing... This is un- unsolvable. So you could also only have, have nested ifs, right? Or something like this. Because if you couldn't say and, so something like, you know, check whether a streak is null and uh, not empty. So it is hard to do this, right? In Pascal. Yeah, yeah, that was the problem. Yeah, so exactly. So, so exactly, yeah, that's a, that's a good example. So if, if uh, ah, that's right, Pascal used nil, which was fine, right? So, if, okay. you know, if string is not nil and, you know, string string length is less than five or something like yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Right? That would fail in Pascal, right? In, in C and in Java, we do that mm-hmm. all the time. But, but, but how, how you could express this in Pascal? This would be impossible because then you would have to nest if statements or something like this. Well, it's not that it was impossible. You, you, this was a problem to be solved. And so people would say, oh, well, what you have to do is you have to nest if statements. Or another one okay. is... Okay, nesting if statements, um, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or, or for loops, a classic one was basically, we, and we did this all the time, which was create a Boolean variable and then you know, assign to the Boolean variable based on some conditional statements. Like okay. That. Mm-hmm. Right. And and anyway, so that was one of the problems. And I remember because I was a TA for a class where we were teaching people Pascal. And what is TA? Technical assistance, something like this. Oh, oh, TA. Yes, yes. Teaching assistant. Teaching assistant. Yeah. Okay. So, so, right. So so uh, as you know, uh, I was I was already a pretty good programmer, and so I picked up Pascal pretty pretty quickly, and so I was able to do my own assignments and then help uh, be the you know I was I was in the more advanced programming classes. Okay. And so I was able to help. Um, you know, we had a help desk at the computer center. And so I spent some time there helping people with, you know, helping the beginning programmers with their, with programs. And, um, also I was the teaching assistant for uh, an introductory class Mm -hmm. at one point. Um, but, but yeah, we wrestled with these things because, and we were well aware of it because, yeah. And in fact, you know, other languages, I think some people are aware of C, you know, it's like, yeah, if only we had conditional statements, right? Because our conditional evaluation. Mm-hmm. Because that was something we fought against. Because, you know, you're explaining to somebody, okay, you know, you have to you have to check this first, but uh, you know, your program will break if you write the expression this way. Mm-hmm. You know, because you're teaching boole- people boolean expressions, and it sort of makes sense. But then, you know, they're they're trying to absorb the idea of a boolean expression, mm-hmm. and at the same time, they're trying to absorb the concept of a boolean expression, and you know, evaluating an if or a mm-hmm. while loop or something like that. At the same time, they're wrestling with this very practical problem of, you know, sometimes you want to check to see whether the array index is in bounds. And if it is in bounds in the same expression, check the value that's there. Uh-huh. And so, so that's just one example of something that we fought against constantly in, in Pascal. Another thing with Pascal is they had a, a very weird IO. It had this look ahead based IO. So, you know, 
something that's so simple is read a line of text and then, you know, print it out. You know, it's like, what is your name? Adam. You know, so you type that in, you know, you know, and then print out hello, comma, Adam. You know, mm -hmm. how, how hard could that be? Right. Well, reading a line of text, the problem is since you had to do look ahead, uh, it's too, I, I actually remember this too well. I don't <laughs> okay. know. If okay. So um, the problem, is, you, you know, if you think nowadays, you think if you read a line, you read all the characters up to and including the line break. But Pascal always had to have something in its look at buffer, and so it would wait for you to type a return again. Okay. Okay, this is so, what I don't remember, but I managed to read something in, in, in Pascal. This is what I remember. And I was really proud in Pascal to to read and write binary stuff. So um, maybe it was a record. So I, I was able to write records to disk, which was not that simple oh. with uh, BASIC, as I remember. So uh, yeah. this is what I did. And um, I spent a little time with Pascal because someone told me uh, Delphi is the real thing. And um, I wanted to start Delphi, but then C++ came. So this was my short story. So what was your, uh, your thing after Pascal? So actually, before we leave Pascal, I think it was one of the C, the C guys. It was either Thompson or Ritchie mm -hmm. uh, wrote a criticism of uh, the Pascal language. Okay, uh, which includes the things like which, which actually, if you're interested, I'll send you a link to that. Okay, um, I don't know if you, I don't know if you wrote that, but but it's sort of I read that paper and I go, yes, this is this is why Pascal bothers me, right? So one of the one of the things was the the lack of a conditional mm -hmm. conditional valuation. Um, another one was, what was the other? Uh, it was, ah, an array's length is part of its type. Okay. And, oh, and okay. so you, you couldn't operate on something that, you know, you couldn't, op you couldn't write a function that operated on strings. Mm -hmm. You could write a function that operated on strings of 10 characters. Okay. Uh, interesting idea, actually, right? So, uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, in I mean, interesting. This is, uh, strange, but, but, but interesting. I mean, to, to come up with something like this, like an O2 Java list with, Various length have different type would be <laughs> would be fun. <laughs> okay, so I'll send that to you. Uh -huh. um, but it is interesting because it it uh, you know and so so Pascal helped a lot of things with you know with things like data structures. Um, actually, dynamic memory allocation you know blew me away. I, you know, pointers new new and delete uh -huh. like like you have malloc and free right. So that was that was completely non-existent in basic. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but. So, so Pascal was a big step forward, but it did have these have these problems that made it impractical. Well, in Pascal, in, in basically, you could uh, use you know pick and pokes and uh, maybe <laughs> write something with it. <laughs> uh, yeah, sort of. That was a little that was a little too low level. I don't think the Wang twenty two hundred had peek and poke though. That okay. that was uh, that was on different uh, that was on different environments. Um. Anyway, yeah. So you said okay. So what happened next? All right. So. So as I moved later in my college career, I started working in computer systems lab at uh, the university, and they were a Unix and C shop. Uh -huh. And uh, so I learned C and which and Unix? It is uh, this was uh, 4.2 BSD Unix on okay. a Vax. Ah, Vax. Okay. So this was uh, when was this? This was the mid 1980s. Okay. Or actually, the early 1980s, early to mid 1980s. Yeah. So that that was. Um, yeah, what was the? You know, it's kind of funny because I, I, I remember, I remember everybody was talking about four point two BSD, and at the time I kind of didn't understand why it was so significant. Because, but, but in a, you know, in retrospect, that was because that was the release where Bill Joy added the sockets interface, which did not exist previously to that, and so, so that was that was a big deal because that was in the very early days of the internet or the ARPANET as we called it then. But the story uh, was somehow that the Bill Joy wrote the socket as a student, right? So as uh, as, a, as a student assignment. So it was like Mission Impossible, and he wrote it. So I, I heard the story somewhere. At least you know, I know mm -hmm. that I, I, I don't know that much about the the development of BSD, but um, uh, I, it was funny. So I should tell you, I, I went to Stanford, and mm -hmm. uh, big rivalry between Stanford and Cal, which is where uh, Bill Joy was. And I know he was a graduate student at the time when he did the the 4.2 BSD stuff. Um, but you know, despite the rivalry, there was a lot of cross pollination mm -hmm. um, between the universities. So we talked to each other a lot. And uh, Stanford was a BSD shop. Okay. And uh, there was we had a whole bunch of uh, Vax machines on campus. Very few of them ran uh, the uh, DEC supported operating system, which was VMS. Mm -hmm. So, so we would get, we would get a VAX and the first thing we would do is install BSD on it. Mm -hmm. 
So that was uh, the workhorse of the academic labs at Stanford in the 1980s. So anyway, I did pick up a lot of stuff. I didn't actually work with the OS guys that much, but I did pick up a lot of stuff. And so one of the things was that uh, uh, it's just a little bit of lore, not even a story. But what uh, what uh, what people said was um, people would talk about what Bill Joy did. And so maybe he did this with the socket stuff or maybe he did with some some other some other things. Um, but people referred to a thing called the Bill Joy Long Weekend. Okay. <laughs> which was, you know, yeah, he was supposed to be doing work or classwork or assignments or whatever during the week. But uh, he would basically spend the entire weekend hacking up something on the Vax. And the reason is, I mean, these are all time-shared machines, right? But mm -hmm. on the weekend, nobody's using it. Okay. So if you're doing stuff in the kernel, you know, you have to take down the machine and reboot it. And if it doesn't work, you have to debug it using the kernel debugger. Mm -hmm. So nobody else can be using using the machine at the time. So you have to sit there in the console. So I think he would sit in the in the machine. I'm guessing a little bit yeah. here, but you know, these were all time sharing systems. Mm -hmm. You know, these weren't personal computers. And so mm -hmm. you'd have to sit in the machine room, you know, doing doing kernel debugging on the console. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's how he uh, hacked his features into the uh, into the kernel. So the story I heard was not about the socket, it was actually about the TCP IP stack at uh, Solaris. So this is what I heard later, but I have no idea. Just uh, so, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't think Bill Joy had any direct involvement with that. Okay. He was certainly involved in it though, because well, and so so my you know, okay, so 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 my my next step after graduation was working at Sun Microsystems. And of course Bill Joy was one, one question regarding regarding VMS and BSD. Was it a, a performance difference between VMS v, VMS and BSD on Vexes back then, or was it did you some was a difference running both you know Unixes on on Vexes or was it just you know pure fashion you know to choosing BSD over VMS? Well, I think um, you know if there was anything, I think people would would claim that VMS performed better than than okay. Unix. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised because, you know, the, the engineers who created VMS wanted yeah. top performance from their mm -hmm. hardware. So they, you know, they, they wrote things that, that, that worked on it very well. Okay. Um, no, I think from a, from the academic standpoint, uh, if you're doing systems research, then Unix is much more amenable to that because yeah. you had source code, you could look at it, you could change it, you could write drivers for it, you could write your own network protocols. And, you know, I, you know, v VMS was closed source. I never worked with VMS, but I don't know if, you know, mm -hmm. you know, suppose you wanted to, you know, suppose you wanted to send a, uh, so suppose you want to send an Ethernet packet. Mm -hmm. Would you do that in VMS? No, um, I, I, but um, I, I know uh, maybe 15 years ago, so VEXs were still used and, uh, and they always run, you know, VMS. So I was surprised that it actually were capable to run BSD. So um, this was why, why I'm asking. So interesting. Well, yeah. So 15 years ago. Well, that was that was quite a bit quite a bit after. Um, yeah, I don't yeah. know what. Right. So this remember this was in the 1980s, and so in <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, Vax was a pretty powerful computer at. Well, it was pretty powerful computer at the time, mm -hmm. but it was also something that. Uh, you know, universities would do systems research on, you know, mm -hmm. so developing network protocols, developing new operating systems and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so and that, that doesn't seem to be done that much anymore. Everybody, if anybody doesn't, does anybody do OS research anymore? I was, I, I read something. It's like people, people not don't do that. Or, you know, maybe, maybe OS research is sort of, you know, hack something, hack something into Linux these days. Maybe uh, I, I, I mean the, the cloud providers, right? So like uh, the virtualization layer and Docker, Kubernetes guys, and uh, you know Firecracker yeah, and and all the stuff. So um, not directly operating system like Linux, but or right. the you know the e how it's called e, EBF, right? The uh, the kernel extensions in in in, in Linux, which allows you, you know to deal with microservices a little bit better. So programmable mm. kernel, so, or how it's called in Linux, XPT, I think, is like you know programmable driver. So uh, yeah, I think a little bit, but not like back then, right? Yeah. But what's interesting? How you started at Sun? So I mean, uh, well, uh, you know, so I was, you know, so I was at Stanford. I was in Silicon Valley, and I didn't want to move. And there were lots of jobs around here, so I I applied at uh, a bunch of places, and uh, there was a lot of cross pollination with uh, with Stanford and various. Uh, you know, various companies around. Uh, Stanford actually had a very close relationship with the uh, uh, DEC research labs because mm -hmm. DEC had two research labs or even three 
Uh, it depends on how you count. They had they had they had several offices in Palo Alto, and there was constant uh, there was constant cross pollination there. And um, but uh, of course, Sun Sun Microsystems was a spin out from Stanford originally as well. Um, but I didn't know any of those folks. But there was a there was a certain affinity there. So you know, people would. You know, people who are graduating would talk about it. it's like, oh, where are you applying to? Oh, you're gonna apply to Sun. Well, I'm gonna apply to HP. Well, you know that kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So people would talk about all that. Mm-hmm. So Sun was one of the places I applied to. Uh, I looked at several departments there, and and actually, you know, so this is this is an amazing. I mean, so part a, a fair amount of my career has been extreme uh, extreme good luck. Okay. So, um, one of the well, the my. You know, so anyway, I applied to a uh, couple of different places, um, you know, got some offers, got some rejections, uh, but nothing was really interesting. And so I said, you know, I don't have to. Uh, so there, were, there were some things about Sun that were very attractive. And oh, <laughs> my, my I, I referred to my uh, one of my older brothers who was a programmer uh, earlier. Yeah. Uh, he actually worked for Sun. Okay. Okay. So it's like, no, that, and I didn't hear a lot of, I, I hear that's, that's one, that's another connection I have. Uh, and he, um, you know, I would talk to him about stuff that was going on and it was really cool. And so I kind of had an affinity for it already. And then, um, you know, a lot of people at Stanford knew a lot of people at Sun. So there was a, you know, good reputation there as well. And, um, so I decided that instead of, Instead of, you know, finding a job immediately after graduation, I got myself uh, like a temporary research job at Stanford while I just kept applying to places. You know, it's kind of interesting thinking about this in retrospect, but, you know, in corporations, when you have openings, they, they open up, people have to fill them, and then the openings go away. Mm-hmm. And then And so you have to wait for a while. So So it was good that I decided to wait instead of taking a job that I didn't really want just to have, have a job. Because during that summer, some openings came up in the Windows Systems Group at Sun, okay. where James Gosling worked. And James was working on the news window system. And so that was my first my first full-time job out of college, was working with James Gosling on the news window system, which was an incredible opportunity. So you knew you James remember. already back then, or was it just... I, I had heard of him by reputation, because he, he wrote the Emacs that we used mm-hmm. On he, he wrote the Unix Emacs, and I'd heard about other stuff he did, but I didn't know it. Okay. But um, when an opening came up in his group, and my my you know actually it was really cool. I was visiting my brother, and he said, "Yeah, they, you know, last last week I checked, um, but uh, they didn't have any openings. But uh, well, let's walk by the recruiter's desk because sometimes you know sometimes things open up, and it was amazing. I remember this. We walked over there, and he introduced me, and he, he says, oh, my brother's uh, looking for a job here. Are there any openings? And she says, yes. As a matter of fact, something just came up this week. Okay. And it, it was an opportunity to work in that group. And that was just an amazing stroke of luck. So, yeah. So, I applied for it and got the job and started. This was in 1986. So, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I was working on the news window system for a while. Was it called news? So, news? Like news? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> we just we just called it news. It's the same pronunciation as the word, but it had this, you know, it had the the weird capitalization. Okay. Uh, the, are you familiar with that at all? No, the, I don't think so. Oh, 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 okay, yeah. So basically, it was the PostScript based window system. Okay. And it was called Network Extensible Window System, and it was all caps except for the E was lowercase. And so, you know, it was one of those things where you play around with the um, the you know changing the case of things in order to get a trademark. Mm-hmm. Right, I found it right now. Uh-huh. Yeah, network extensible so window system. That's Postcard. right, exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep, that's it. That's it. And was it on at Sun Microsystems, of course? And was it Solaris already, or was it called Solaris? Uh, no, this was before Solaris. So, so at the time, uh, the operating system that that this all ran on, I think they just called it Sun OS. Okay, and it was derivative of of BSD. Of course, Bill Joy was one of the founders of Sun, right? So mm-hmm. all the BSD came over so so um so it was sun os 3.x at the time and then sun os 4.x came along uh, and then several years later i mean it was sun os 5 but then the marketing branding was solaris so everybody calls it solaris now. okay but uh yeah that was um 
and the the Sun OS five Solaris stuff was uh, there's this whole history of all the Unix wars with uh, you know AT and T and HP and DEC and IBM and all that, right? Mm-hmm. So that was that was all that. I was kind of I kind of watched all that stuff happen. Um, you know, it was kind of uh, that was that was actually an unpleasant uh, unpleasant aspect of 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 being there, which was the um, the the industry politics. Yeah. And um cuz cuz there were also a bunch of industry politics around Windows systems. Yeah. Right? So there was the news Windows system but but as you know the X Windows system is what really eventually took over. Exactly. And so that was that was difficult. And uh, you've wrote the news Windows system or you uh programmed it to in, in C or C++? What was the language to? Uh this was this was all C. This was before C++. Okay. Uh-huh. And uh oh, well before C, I mean, I think Struestrup was actually developing C plus plus at the same time, but but everybody everybody all you know up until up until sometime in the nineteen nineties, everything everything was in C. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't start using C plus plus until sometime later. Um, for mm-hmm. you know, there are other reasons for that, which we can go into if you're interested. But. And do you think that uh, news was better than X Windows? Well, it's you know, and that's <laughs> so we had a. Bunch- <laughs> politics about this as you might as you might expect and there were some things that were very 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 good about news and there were some things that were very 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 bad about news. Mm-hmm. so the good thing about it was that the it used what we call the postscript imaging model mm-hmm. which basically um you could draw lines curves mm-hmm. in arbitrary combinations and fill and stroke and outline um it's kind of if you look at something like SVG, mm-hmm. very similar imaging model, um, much better way to deal with um, uh, much better way to deal with graphics. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you could your graphics was all with respect to um, a transformation a, 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 a full uh, a full two D transformation matrix, mm-hmm. which meant that you could do scaling uh, rotation. Arbitrarily, yeah. This is what uh, I thought because those, you know, PostScript was still used as a document, you know, for uh, those of the PS yeah. documents, which were could be beautiful, exactly. Right? right? Yeah, it's it's the it's yeah it's a, it's the same stuff. And I think the big idea of the news window system was let's use PostScript to draw on the screen as well as on paper. Yeah, <clears throat> and so that was the big promise of it. Um, and so, from a graphical standpoint. Um, it was it was very nice. Uh, I think the the transform the 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 you know two D tra- full two D transforms was useful. They they also composed well, and so you could take you could take a diagram or you could take a drawing which include included text and scale it down and include it inside of another drawing, or you could rotate it yeah. or anything like that. And everything just composed beautifully. I mean, there was some. I mean, it's a you know the and this this was uh, actually you know the the. These guys who, you know, Warnock and Geschke, who came out of uh, Xerox Park, founded Adobe, right? Mm-hmm. I think they, you know, they had a, you know, really great advance there in a way to draw 2D graphics. Mm-hmm. And that was the great thing about the news window. The bad thing about the news window system was that it was a, it was a, you know, it was a window server and in, in superficially similar to the X window system. So you, when you run your application, it connects to the server and it sends commands over to the server, and the server is what paints on the screen. The problem is there was, well, the biggest problem I think was that there was an enormous amount of shared state mm-hmm. in inside the server, and clients could interact over that shared state, and uh, if the if that shared state uh, became corrupted, your Windows system would hang. Mm-hmm. And scalability and was, was another problem, maybe right? If this is that much state, and you have m- multiple clients, well, it's it's kind of it's it's kind of a, it's it's like a it's like an OS it's it's a it's like an OS problem, yeah, right. So I mean, you know, think of think about DOS, yeah. right? So if you have a program with a bug in it, it scribbles over memory, your whole machine will hang. You have to yeah. reboot, yeah. right? Whereas if you have a multitasking system like Unix, like you know, if uh, if a program goes awry and scribbles on memory, it it gets uh, it gets a signal and you know it, you know it dies and the rest of the the rest of the machine keeps running. That's because there's an OS that enforces a production boundary between processes. Mm-hmm. New did not have that, so it was essentially a shared memory machine inside the server, 
So if there was a bug or if clients, if, if clients interfered with each other, then the window system would, bad things would happen. Yeah. And I'm, uh, if it would, uh, and security would be another one, right? Because uh, I, I would say this, this, this postscript, it was interpreted probably. And uh, right now it wouldn't sur survive, I would say. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So we weren't even thinking about security. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, if you tried to make such a, a system secure, I think that would be very difficult. I haven't, I hadn't even thought about it from, from that standpoint. Uh, I think the main problem is with shared, uh, you know, if you have shared state and there's, there's no protection boundaries, any, any client could do anything that it wanted. Yeah. And so since these were connected to the network, mm -hmm. right, any, anybody, you know, in principle, anybody on the network could mm -hmm. connect you to your window system and mm -hmm. draw things on the screen. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, I think it would be very difficult to make, uh, I mean, it might be possible, but I think we were still, we, we never actually in, in the news window system, we never actually solved the problem of protecting shared state. But, um, very interesting idea, uh, postscript based operating system. So I, w I was not aware of it. So yeah, perfect. Well, it wasn't an operating system. It was a window system. A window system. But, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it ran, ran on Sun OS and it was window system. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We, but, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting in that we, we, we ought to have applied more OS level thinking to it and we did not. And that, that was, I think, one of the big problems with, mm -hmm. with Postgres based Windows. And is it still available in the old version or is this completely gone? Is, the, is there any running uh, example of a uh, Postgres based operating system? I don't know, right? So the other big design win for the Adobe stuff was, Adobe had a, a, a technology which in some level was competing. It was called Display Postscript. Okay. And that was integrated into the Next window system. Okay. And, of course, you know, the history of Next, right, which is Steve Jobs. Yeah. And all the Next stuff ended up in Apple. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if there is literally any Postscript in the Macintosh stuff. Maybe it is, you know. This is in the newest Monterey. It's like a news... Uh... 88 or something like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, okay. I, I'm not, you know. So how, how long you actually stick with the uh, new system and what happened then? So I can imagine what then happened, but. Uh... Yeah, there was a tremendous amount of pressure to, to deliver um, a version of the X window system. So for a few years, we tried to create a combined uh, window system called the X news merge. Okay. And so it was a single, it was a single, uh, it was a single Windows system server that supported both news and X at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of an interesting, interesting idea. And the idea was, you know, if people were writing, you know, people were writing X applications, mm -hmm. then we could run those. And if people were writing news applications, we could run those too. And they could share the same desktop. And okay, that, that made some sense. The problem was, as time went on, it became clear that nobody was writing any news applications. Mm -hmm. And so after a while, we just kind of dropped the news side. Mm -hmm. We actually integrated Display Postscript for a while, but nobody used that either. Okay. Which is kind of sad. Yeah. So basically, after, after a while, um, it became, uh, uh, became just an, an, an X only window system, which okay. I think most of them are today. Yeah. And then there's, there's some, still some window system stuff going on in the, next world but i've completely lost track of it at this point but at the time I, I i kind of moved up the stack a little bit i i worked more on desktop stuff mm -hmm. we had this thing called open windows remember open look and motif yes I don't know if you remember, yeah. remember those right so sun sun had this way of in, in involving itself in industry uh, technology wars mm -hmm. right? so we did all, <laughs> yeah i mean it was actually the open look stuff was the same as the it was, it was part of the same war. It was another bat. It was a different battle in the same war that Sun was fighting over Unix and Solaris and, and, uh, OSF. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember OSF. Mm -hmm. All of these, uh, the, the open source, open source foundation. Yeah. Um, that was DEC, HP and IBM. Okay. OSF never did very well with the operating system, but they kind of won the window system war in that, that motif became the dominant, um, desktop technology for probably the next decade or so mm -hmm. yeah so anyway yeah so i worked on that stuff for a while okay and then you i mean and then yeah. uh, i spent a couple of years working on some some e-commerce stuff which is kind of just uh it was kind of an experiment that sun did uh i learned a lot it was a it was a it was a good project while it lasted but uh was it already it, in java or was it still c plus plus 
actually at at that that was the f- so so that was okay so 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 we just sped you know we just sped through 10 years of my history at sun and so so at that point java 1.0 had come out or maybe 1.1 but um, so if it. you worked with James and James was involved in early Java, so oh. why you didn't follow James and over to Java? Um, you know, I think you know we ended up working on different stuff. I mean, okay. people moved around the company and and what in different ways, right? So early on, I was working with James on news, but uh, you know, he he went off and did different things, and I went off and did different things as well. Okay, so when he formed the group that I was not part of the group that uh, that initially formed Java. Mm-hmm. I remember all those guys. Was the Java uh, Soft group you uh, it was it was well, I don't remember all the history of of um uh of of the Java team, but this is well before Java Soft. Okay. Remember Oak? Yeah, Oak. Oak mm-hmm. Green Project, right? Mm-hmm. So those guys. Right? So mm-hmm. I, I remember I remember a bunch of those guys. Uh, a bunch of those guys used to work on the desktop and Windows system. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so when James um decided to form that, he uh you know, he he picked a few people that he was working with at the time and he said, okay, let's go off and do this new thing for, you know, set top boxes and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I, I heard that that was going on, but that was, you know, that was kind of mm-hmm. distant from what I was working on at the time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so he and I were, were no longer, I mean, it was just, you know, you're in a big company and people move around. Yeah, sure. and, mm-hmm. so, um, so anyway, yeah. So, but you were so aware t- back then of Oak and, uh, and, and the development or was it like, you know, secret project inside Sun? It, it was mostly secret, but things, you know, word got around. Okay. Um, well, I mean, word got around that they were working on something. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know what. Mm-hmm. Um, but at a certain point, they did They did decide to go public, and they had some public presentations about uh, Star 7, mm-hmm. which was the, the initial set. What was it? The handheld remote control set-top yeah. box thing? You mm-hmm. know, I mean, this is all well-documented by other people. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, I, remember, I remember when that was announced. Uh, and then they also rolled out, uh, you know, the JDK, and so people said, "Hey, there's this new programming language these guys came up with. Let's try it out." Mm-hmm. So by the time I switched off of Windows systems and desktop stuff onto e-commerce, mm-hmm. uh, Java was a thing. And so I think we built our um, we built our prototype of an e-commerce server in Java using JDK. It might have been 1.1. And Java web so, server, I assume. That might have that might have come later. I remember when. Uh, I remember JDBC was new at the time because we wanted to store some some stuff in the database, and so mm-hmm. you know we we anxiously were waiting for the next release or something because it had JDBC in it, and then we could we could talk to the database in a standard way. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't remember. Funny you say that because uh, yeah. I worked at the same time also on e-commerce server with uh, also with JDBC one one. Uh, a Java one one and also JDBC was new and I got I waited for the Java web server and um, I remember it was um, it was Sylvester so it was the end of year I think 1996 something like this and I was able to download this and the problem was there was no way to install the JDBC what? driver because we we had to access Oracle so what I had to do is um, I still remember that there was one jar. So I actually, you know, opened the jar and merged the classes <laughs> with the jar and zipped that again. And I was the hero, you know. I was I was the 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 rock star because I was able, you know, to to merge two jars. And um and this was one of my first projects. So um so um before that, maybe you 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 but the Java web server was a thing. And it what it came, you know, with an admin console which was applet based. It was actually a nice server. Yeah. We didn't you know, I don't know. I don't know what was going on with Java Web Server. We didn't use the web server. We we wanted to create just a a a, a, a kind of a standalone server that accepted network connections. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um and that also talked to um you know that also talked to a database. Okay. So so it's kind of interesting. Nowadays, you might call it an application server. And mm-hmm. the interesting thing was, in order to you know, as part of part of our system, we actually um. We actually licensed uh, an early version of WebLogic. Oh, yeah, Tenga. And, the name was Tenga, I assume. I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't remember Tenga at all. I just remember this thing called WebLogic, and it was the, it was the new, it was the new thing because it was, it was an application server that was pure Java. Th- that's and, strange because Tenga was the name before WebLogic. 
And oh, they call it Tenga because Tenga was an, another island of Java in the near of Java. So ah. Tenga with H. And uh, I remember as Tenga became web logic. This is also when I used web logic. But it seems like you already used web logic, not Tenga. So it was later. But uh, interesting story. So actually, the Sun internally used uh, web logic. Mm -hmm. What what I suspected that you had to use Genie, you know, for for the e-commerce server. You remember Genie, Java Intelligent yeah, Network? I, I remember hearing Jordan? a lot about Genie, but we never we never did anything with Genie. I don't remember. Okay. And, and so I also want to stress, we never this e-commerce project. Um, we never we never delivered product. We mm -hmm. created a prototype, and we actually put that prototype into a pilot project with some banks and mm -hmm. moved some money around with it. But at at a certain point, you know, management there was no support in in my management to deliver this as a project. So, but it worked well. I, I thought it was in in. I think there's some interesting ideas in it. I mean, it worked reasonably well. You know, uh, okay. It, Funny, the you know, uh, did did we? This must have been before the JIT compiler stuff came in. It was all interpreted, yeah. and so it was a little bit slow. But the fact is that most of the, um, you know, everything else was slow, right? So, mm -hmm. well, JDK one eight, uh, one one eight. This is what I remember also because yeah. before that it was very slow. With JDK one one eight was um, a really a speed speed increase. Yeah, I think the I think the first JIT was in. I mean, well, not not the first not the first JIT ever, but the first JIT that was part of Sun's JDK was in one point three. There were there yeah, were but this was where they bought you know the hotspot, right? But uh, the 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 hotspot, but the JIT, what I remember was one 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 eight. So I'm I waited for the one one eight the entire time because I had a laptop and a notebook and it didn't work well without the JIT. And this was the first JIT, but it JITed everything at once. And the hotspot was, was was more smart about that, you know. This was one of three. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. That might. I know there was the semantic jit, and then there was. Uh, yeah. There, there were a couple other jits floating around. I don't see. See, I, I was, I was a user of Java at the time, not a developer of Java. So I don't, I don't remember what that. Uh, yeah. I don't remember all the stuff. I just, I remember some of the things that were flying around at the time, but uh, mm -hmm. not, uh, not that much about the technology because I was mm -hmm. using it from the outside. Let's see what what next. <laughs> yeah, uh, what next? There's the web. Uh, the, this you you've wrote the e-commerce server. What interests me, you know, now your trajectory with Java. So it seems like yeah, you stick with Java from then, right? Well, okay. So so I think the thing, yeah. So the e-commerce thing was it. I mean, it was an interesting digression for my career path. I mean, I learned a lot of stuff. It was in many respects, it was a good, it was a good project, but uh, you know, it got swallowed up with corporate project, uh, corporate politics and stuff. And so. Um, you know, and that that's always unpleasant. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, so the time came that I needed to, um, you know, find another job. And so uh, I figured, well, you know, I kind of like Sun, so I should look around the company. And I had a lot of friends at the company, too. And so mm -hmm. one of my friends was working on a project called Personal Java, uh -huh. which was, I guess it was part of JavaSoft. Um, but they were working on what eventually became Java ME. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? remember yeah, sure. The, uh, I, I remember personal Java, and I also remember Java ME as well, micro edition. Yeah, JTME. yeah. So, so at a certain point, they 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 kind of realigned everything around the different editions. Since there was enterprise, what I also still have. I have the Java ring. Oh, I have one of those around here somewhere too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 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 at the, so that was you know so that was up, we're up to about 1999 now, and so there was. Um, Enterprise Edition, Standard Edition, and Micro Edition, mm -hmm. and so so I moved over into that group, and we did um, uh, we did a lot of work uh, for Java for the Java uh, technology that got put into the uh, you know the cell phones of that era. So yeah. Java ME was on there, and I don't know if you remember any of the uh, the um, all the uh, letter the the abbreviations CLDC mid P. Yeah, I don't know if you. But the different profiles. There was the, the you know the high profile and uh, right. There was the mid P and uh, yeah. Yeah. So so basically yeah. So 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 uh, the the VM was a configuration and um, profile was a set of class libraries. Mm -hmm. And so so those were so those were either um, strict subsets of Java SE or in the case of the um, user interface libraries or the applicate the higher level application libraries. Um, those were actually, th those are actually their own things. So we developed, 
Um, so MIDP was Mobile Information Device Profile. Uh, basically, it was a class library that that uh, that handled um, user interface, record storage, graphics, uh, networking, mm-hmm. and so you could write uh, you could write rudimentary applications on cell phones that way. Mm-hmm. And I guess you know, I guess that got designed into a lot of phones. I mean, that's that's where this whole billions of devices thing came from. Yeah. Well, I think that's I think billions of devices are now supported by Java Card, which is a whole other story. But um, and Blu-ray players. Uh, yes, that's true. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So the Blu-ray stuff came out of the other part of Java ME, which was a, a, a different configuration. But uh, yeah. But but you've wrote actually the Windowing system for J two ME then again. Uh, part of well, I wrote it. I wrote a bunch of specifications for it. Yeah, and then so okay. Mike was responsible for the. And, you know, it's funny, you wouldn't even call it a windowing system, but basically it's the user interface because yeah. you didn't need those, you'd take over the whole screen. So, but yeah, yeah. so basically, actually, you know, in, in certain respects, that was, it was the same thing because, you know, I was brought into that team because <clears throat> one of the, one of the reasons I, you know, they hired me out of that team because I had, I had a lot of uh, graphics and user interface programming experience. Yeah. Actually, so, I got at Java One the Palm Pilot, which with J2ME on it. Ah, yes. Uh-huh. This was 2000, I think. 2000, 2001. Yeah. 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 I remember a couple of years after that, it's like I got the Sharp Zorus. That was the. Yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> it was an incredible device. It, it had even a terminal, the uh, the Sharp. It, it was the only. <laughs> the, the, it, it, was, it was pretty amazing because you could hold this thing in your hand, and you could do yeah. Linux on it, and you could type it to shell. That was, that yeah. was just cool. I, I never was able to do anything with it, but it's like, wow, look at this. I can type commands at the shell. Look, LS. Oh, look, there's a directory there. <laughs> yeah, similar. I had also the Nokia communicator with uh, with a uh, true keyboard. It also had Java on it. Mm. No, it's not a flip phone. You can open the phone. It looked like a brick, which could be opened yeah. and with, a, with a proper keyboard. So, um, yeah, it was not, it was usable as a phone. I was really excited, but you couldn't do anything useful with it except yeah. you know, well, you know, it's and close it <laughs> for the for the job me work. Uh, we did a lot of uh, we you know we had the uh, well before before we got totally em- embroiled in industry politics. Uh, we ended up spending <laughs> um, a lot of time with the device manufacturers, in particular yeah. Nokia and Motorola, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I I remember being blown away by the stuff that the Nokia guys had, the, the Nokia communicator, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, everybody was getting cell phones, and it was sort of kind of amazing that you could carry around a phone in your pocket, yeah. and it, right, and and you could you could make calls on it and send text messages. Like, wow, mm-hmm. well, that, that's what you could do, right? This yeah. was even before Java was on cell phones. But I yeah. remember working with the the guys at Nokia. And I remember I, I drew a diagram or something and, and, you know, we were emailing constantly, mm-hmm. you know, specs and whatnot. And I drew a diagram or something and, you know, how do you send a diagram through email? I said, you know, maybe I could just fax it to you. I said, what, I said what's your fax number? And he says, oh, it's the same as my regular phone number. I'm like, what? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because his phone number was his communicator. And so I went over to our fax machine and faxed him the thing and... You know, it seemed just like a fax because, you know, you hear the, all the tones and beeps and stuff. And the next time we had a meeting, he opened up his communicator and showed me the fax. He says, oh, yeah, when you sent me that fax, I looked at the diagram right on the communicator. I was just totally blown away by that. This is true. This is also what I used. It also worked on my communicator with my, you know, uh, um, how it is called, um, contract with uh, the telecom. So I could fax actually and uh, and back and forth uh, with my communicator. This is really true, and it worked well. And I remember it looked like a progress bar. So you you saw actually how the uh, fax is arriving on my on my yeah. phone. So this was a, n- a nice animation. I- yeah. So that was around two thousand or two thousand one. Uh, yeah. And so now, of course, you know we all have smartphones with high res. Yeah. High res uh, screens, right? But you know, in two thousand, that that was I was. On the one hand, I was blown away by the fact that you could hold something and make calls from a portable phone when mm-hmm. when the only portable phone I knew of was something that was a brick that 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 you could put in your car, right? Mm-hmm. You know, the, you know, the 1960s, you know, James Bond had a phone in his car, right? That that was yeah. it's like wow, yeah. That, yeah. That was easy. <clears throat> right? So the fact that you'd hold hold a phone in your hand is one thing, but then the fact that you could you could 
you know, send and receive emails from your phone. It was like, you know, head explode, right? <laughs> yeah. And GPS. So my Nokia also had a GPS. It was external. It was yeah. also then uh, really interesting. But um, so how much t uh, time um, did you spend with uh, J2ME? Uh, six or seven years, I think. Okay. So this was almost like before Oracle bought Sun, right? Because if you, you are talking right now, yeah. year 2000. Oh. <clears throat> I remember transitioning off of that uh, about 2006 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, so 1999 to 2006. So it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't quite the Oracle acquisition yet. Uh, so there was still a few years for that, but that was a okay. very bad time for Sun because Sun was, uh, Sun never really, okay. So there was the dot com bust in 2001, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. and Sun never really recovered from that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we got back on our feet and managed to get the financials in order so that we weren't losing money anymore. But every, you know, a after that, nothing was ever the same again. It was, yeah. you know, everything was always, you know, strict expense controls and, you know, can't spend money on that. And yeah, so I worked on Java ME for a few more years after that. Uh, and then spent a couple of years on Java FX, which we can talk about uh, before transferring onto the, um, into the JDK group. Um, so, so you worked on Java FX as well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's interesting. I, I I really like, still like Java. It, it was a great technology, and um, so it was. It also, it was really interesting how it began, right? Because it was an own language. I forgot actually the guy. You know, the, someone came in from outside from Sun, and yeah. he's. He, uh, you remember his name? I've, and, and he. Oliver. Yes, exactly. And he uh, uh, say it again. Chris Oliver. Yeah, exactly. Chris Oliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually never met the guy. Um, but uh, so he had this thing called F3. Exactly. Um, form, follow, form follows function, right? To, yeah. That's right, yeah. There there were some interesting things about it. Um, but boy, talk there there were there were some there was a huge amount of internal conflict over F3 and the existing Java team and what to do with it and the creation of FX. Um, and I actually don't know the half of it because okay. I came on to FX somewhat later after, after things had stabilized a little bit. Um, okay. but I came on when we decided that, um, there, so, so we still, so basically somebody decided that F3 was a little too ad hoc. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, we decided to pay attention to, at, from uh, from a, a more rigorous programming language standpoint. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is where Brian Getz came in. Mm -hmm. um, he did some work on, on the language, which was at the time called JavaFX Script. Yeah. Remember that? That's, that's what it was called. Yeah. It was, that's what it was called after F3, but before we decided to... So. I wrote the entire book about JavaFX Script. And then yeah. it was discontinued, and uh, I was about to publish. It was one week, you know. Um, and I said, okay, no problem. It was fun because I wrote all the books, you know, in trains, and I was on a travel. So it's not like I invested a huge amount. I invested a huge amount of my dead time, but not like, you know, productive time. Ah, yeah. I was, I was not, not very sad, but uh, still I remember because uh, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, how to structure applications and I'd actually use it. And um, yeah, and then um, it was it was canceled. And I remember publishers said, "Okay, um, we cannot publish it. I'm really sorry, so I got <laughs> Doesn't matter." I said, "Okay, we can. You know, it's just 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 happens." And uh, yeah, but this is why I remember really JavaFX script, and I actually liked the JavaFX script. But um, behind the scenes, it it I heard stories like it is terrible. But from the usage perspective, it was it was not as bad. Well, let's yeah, we don't need to talk. <laughs> There, well, so when, when I was working on it, I think we had put most of the conflict uh, conflict behind us. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was, I, I you know, I don't I don't know most of it, but uh, yeah. there was, you know, whenever there's, you know, whenever whenever there's conflict in a group, you know, people move around, people quit and whatnot. But I think all of that was all that happened before I joined the FX team. Mm -hmm. so I, no, but it's but, still interesting, you know, because uh, Sun was known as a Java shop, and we had actually two two more languages, like like the F three and JavaFX Script, which was based on the F three. Right. Yeah. So when I came on the scene, FX Script was um, was something that you know uh, 
uh, we needed to pay attention to. And so I was on the team. You know, actually, it is kind of interesting how much how much time I spent on graphics because I spent a couple of years uh, developing uh, UI components for job FX. So okay. here I am, user interfaces again. <laughs> um, but we were doing that in job FX script. And, uh, you know, it was interesting because what's what's the right there's there's the design problems that have to do with you know developing developing an api for the user interface components themselves mm-hmm. right and that's what the the awt folks and the swing folks and some of those folks were still working on this i don't know if you remember richard bear yes uh, mm-hmm. yeah he was job fx architect for uh, for a while i worked with him on uh mm-hmm. on, very closely for a mm-hmm. few years. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, good guy. Um, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so he had a lot of swing experience, and it's very interesting because, you know, people, people actually, here's the thing, remember? And I, Jasper I, Potts as well, right? So Richard Baer and Jasper Potts was the designer. Uh, what's uh, Jasper? Jasper Potts. Jasper, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I worked with Rich and Jasper on a lot of stuff. And those guys, yeah, it's, they're, they're no longer at Oracle. They went to Hedera, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're working together on some stuff. So, but um, yeah, so they were working on FX script, and um, it's interesting to see the the things that inform design decisions, right? So, um, I haven't looked at FX in a while, but if but I if I'm not mistaken, a lot of the components in FX are 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 final classes. I uh, don't I don't know uh, what happens right now. Is like uh, you, you know Johan Foss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He took over more or less these uh, Java Vix and 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 he's uh, like you know the maintainer, and uh, yeah. Java Vix has a revival right now because it was combined with Graal VM, so you can compile it to native code, and you can yeah. uh, uh, run it on uh, or sell it from App Store even. So um, I think it's a really interesting technology again, and it could actually become popular or more popular than before. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Well, but I wanted to touch on a particular design decision, uh, which was mm-hmm. a lot of those, a lot of the UI component classes in FX, at, at least at the time, I don't know if they still are, but at the time, they were final classes, meaning you could not subclass them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and that was, uh, you can, you know, the credit or blame is uh, due to Rich Bear on that. And okay. the reason is, and I remember talking to him about this, right? Because we were both familiar with this. One of the problems with Swing was that Swing allowed, um, uh, basically allowed any component to be subclassed. Yeah. When the implementation of a component calls public methods on itself, though, what, what, uh, that, you know, the self use of the mm-hmm. implementation becomes visible to subclasses. Mm-hmm. And when you have subclasses that depend on that, now, all of a sudden, it becomes extremely difficult to evolve the implementation. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the problems that the Swing folks uh, quickly ran into, which was they put all the stuff out there, and people say, oh, this is great. Oh, I want I want to do something else. So they create a subclass of button and tweaked it around until it did what they wanted. And then the new release comes out, and um, it, it breaks the code. Mm-hmm. And so uh, and so there's even a name for this phenomenon. The uh, What is it? Is it the... The, the fragile base class problem or the brittle base class problem. I mean, it has a bunch of different names, but there are even okay. Wikipedia articles about this. Okay. But, uh, and it's especially a problem in a user interface toolkit because a lot of user interface toolkits are callback based. Mm-hmm. And so the timing when callbacks occur and what callbacks are allowed to do and what are not allowed to do and what state they can observe, you know, when, when the callback is running. Um, people write programs that depend, that, that make, uh, dependencies on that, and as a result, the subclass becomes completely intertwined with the superclass, which is inside the user interface toolkit. And uh-huh. so, if you e- evolve the user interface toolkit, if you if you make some change in the behavior, then you have no idea if you're breaking anybody. And often, in fact, you are breaking somebody. Okay, so anyway. Richard Richard Bia fixed the problem. What you would like oh, to he, so so basically <laughs> it sort of he said okay so when we do this when we write the new UI components for Java FX mm-hmm. we're going to prevent people from subclassing them okay by making them final okay but, so. but that's an interesting systems lesson because that applies everywhere it's not just the user interface toolkit thing it's a general uh, subclassing problem mm-hmm. 
uh, which, which, which in fact, <laughs> you know, is, is still active to this day in the collections framework, but, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> no, but, um, so uh, you've worked on Java VIX and you've wrote components, you said. So which components were written by you? You know, I don't think I actually wrote components themselves. What did, what did I spend a lot of time? Uh, <laughs> I remember, you know, and there are a lot of, it was, it was kind of sad because there were a lot of things that, that we did a lot of work on that never really went anywhere. Um, I remember working with uh, one of the, one of the, one of the coolest things was I, I was working on a two, 2D traversal algorithm with a user interface designer. And okay. that was really fun. And so, so, <clears throat> and basically, you know, and this is, you know, if you, you know, basically the idea of traversal is if you have arrow keys, how do you navigate mm -hmm. from component to component? So I think, I think Swing's traversal model is hierarchical, uh, hierarchical cycles. And so okay. like if you can, you can navigate from one panel to the next and you can go into a panel and then cycle through uh, components within that panel. But that's like mm -hmm. tab at shift tab or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what we wanted to do was 2D traversal. And so if you, you TV user interfaces tend to be 2D traversal. Okay. So you have a bunch of components on the screen and you say move left and it chooses a component that's to the left. But, but your, your components are, are not always in, you know, a nice, you know, a nice even grid. So mm -hmm. the question is, you know, where do you go? And one of the things we were trying to do was avoiding, um, you know, there, there are two problems you can get, which is if you, if you keep hitting the same arrow, you want to keep making progress. You don't want to get in, you don't want to get caught in a loop. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is you, you don't want, uh, you don't want to have uh, a component be stranded or, or have a, a counterintuitive way to get to it. This is actually a hard problem. This reminds me of, uh, no, the, uh, tra uh, traveling salesman problem. Very similar, right? Well, Right. So it's a graph problem. It, that's exactly yeah. it. It's, it's, it's a graph problem in the sense that you have a connected series of nodes. You want to make sure that the nodes are connected. Yeah. Um, but it's also a graphical problem because the user is looking at the screen yeah. and you press the right arrow and you, the user might expect it to go to the component to the right, but it goes to a different component. Like, why mm -hmm. did it do that? Mm -hmm. Right. So anyway. So we spent, we spent a fair amount of time, but that, you know, it was, it was really fun because, because, you know, I was actually, I, I actually used trigonometry for the first time in, in a long time. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it, like, I, I can imagine this is really hard. I mean, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that never saw the light of day, which was, which was, which was sad. Okay. H how important was Java VIX for Sun back then? Was it like, you know, a very important project or was it like, you know, a guerrilla team or what was it? <laughs> It, well, it was, it was, it was interesting. I mean, it was another, it was one, another thing that, that was a source of a lot of conflict, which was the company was shrinking at the time, but at the same time, the job the FX team managed to grow. So how mm -hmm. is that possible? Right? Mm -hmm. Because other teams were doing layoffs. And so basically, uh, various other teams were, were, you know, were either co-opted or, or their personnel was, re were reduced in order to put more staffing on job FX. Okay. And, uh, that certainly caused a lot of conflict. And what was interesting was, you know, in the JDK group at the time, mm -hmm. I think there might have, I think at the smallest, there were two people working on what we now call core, li core libraries. Mm -hmm. And the core libraries team now has 17 people on it and it is still understaffed. And so you can imagine <laughs> yeah. that if you had two people maintaining yeah. the same stuff, it, you know, you know, they were, you know, completely inundated. Right. So, what I remember, there was on BOF at Java One with the core JDK team. So I really, you know, like to attend the BOFs. And there were yeah. four or five people on stage back then. I was yeah. already uh, surprised. There were just, you know, the, and I asked, you know, is everyone there? Yeah, yeah. We and and but they they really had fun. But there were like four or five people on stage back then. Yeah. So so the JDK team at at that time uh, was. Uh, there were lots of layoffs. There were lots of people quitting and lots of people were taken off of the JDK to work 2007, on 2007, right? 2007, 2008, was, I guess. Two, yeah, 2007 through 2010 or so. The Oracle acquisition was in 2010. Mm -hmm, exactly. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, that was a very bad time for Sun. It was less bad on the Java FX team because it was viewed as being very important. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yeah. Um, and there was the uh, Java FX shop, I remember. Was also on the horizon, right? Oh, the application store. 
application store exactly yeah uh-huh. yeah well, lots of buzz on uh, java one was announced by Jan- jonathan schwartz i remember you know this was like uh this java fix was always on the keynotes of java one actually that was something that brian gets worked on as well i remember talking to him about uh Mm-hmm. The, the the java the java store yeah but yeah that was yeah that was the same that was stuff that was going on at the time um yeah. i mean it was viewed as very important but at the same time it was it was unclear where that was going to go like or yeah i guess you know and you know there was sort of a strategy there i think that people were <clears throat> people were saying at the time the buzzword was rich internet application exactly and so if people wanted to write rich applications then use java fx to do that Mm-hmm. And uh, a better way of distributing them instead of like, you know, clicking on a link on a website is, you know, we need a, we need a unified way to present these. So maybe we, maybe we need an application store. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether that was a viable business model for Sun, I'm quite skeptical of whether that would have ever turned out, but, but it kind of sort of made sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the biggest competitor back then was no flash and flex from Adobe. So this was right. like the only, and from Microsoft was also something on the horizon. Yeah. Um, right. Silverlight, exactly. Yeah, I don't even know anything about that. I just remember the name. Yeah, Silverlight, exactly. Uh huh. So. And uh, so, so you worked the entire time for JavaFX, and then Oracle took over Sun, right? Yeah. So let's see. What was the other thing? Um, oh, right. So actually, this is sort of an interesting. So you asked me what I worked on in JavaFX. I'm trying to remember. I ended up working on kind of. So I didn't actually work on the components themselves, but I worked on a lot of infrastructure. And mm-hmm. one of the things was 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 flushing out idiosyncrasies in the language and the runtime. Okay. And um, so I spent a lot of time on that. You know, there was traversal. Uh, one of the things was that it was, it was never, uh, it was never clear what the relationship of uh, job FX has a lot of CSS in it, which is kind of yeah. an interesting. Thing. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember like spending day, you know, you know, we had all the CSS stuff in, but it was never documented anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> remember, and I remember, so, so somewhere there's a, gi- somewhere on a Java FX, uh, documentation, there's a gigantic page that has all the CSS attributes for all the, con- all the controls. Yeah, exactly. Uh, because, uh, I look at that and, and, uh, I think they were generated from annotations. So I looked how they were created, right? And the CSS, uh, documentation was generated. Oh, was it? Well, maybe they generate it now, but at the time it wasn't generated. In fact, there okay. was no documentation. <clears throat> I actually mm-hmm. went through and, and and painstakingly looked at all the at, the CSS attributes for every component and and mm-hmm. figured out where they came from. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe at some point somebody added some something to generate that stuff. But yeah, that okay. was a problem because it was really cool what you could do with CSS, but nobody knew what you would do with it because nothing was documented. Yeah, you exactly. Kind of- so I I was really I was really interested in CSS because for me I tried to understand yeah. what it is, and this was almost like dependency injection. There was like you know CSS with the configuration, and you could actually change the look and feel or you basically setters were invoked right or 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 yeah. well yeah i mean you could change the fonts you could change the colors yeah. you could change, yeah. change, change things like that yeah so uh, change, change things like you know simple graphical things like the amount of padding and whatnot yeah that was that was really cool um so that was that was one of the things i did um ah uh, i got a war story for you you might be interested in this yeah well, <clears> sure <throat> war story is always good. all right so so you know the the java fx uh standard demo uh which is uh, call, I think it's, is this still called Ensemble? Um, does that make sense? Yes. And Tesla. There were two. Oh, I didn't know about Tesla, but, but back in the day. The Roadster had... Tesla. There was an old Tesla demo, and this was uh, the Tesla Roadster. This was written in Java VIX. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Uh, that might have been after I worked on it. So, so we had Ensemble, which is kind of a rewrite of Swing Set. Yeah. And uh, so, so our standard, uh, <clears throat> our standard test was, uh, to, you know, <clears throat> we had a bunch of unit tests. We had a continuous build system. We had a bunch of unit tests, but of course it's, it's graphical. And so at a certain point, somebody had to, you know, pop up ensemble and made sure that it looked right. Yeah. And there were these cases. It was interesting. So the, most of the team was on the same hallway, but there was this anecdote. A couple people had run into this where, you know, they do a build and they would, um, you know, they would run Ensemble or they'd run their application or something and weird things would happen. Like, okay. you know, imagine you have a text, you have, imagine you have a text box, you have some, you know, some text filled into it and you have the, you know, the, the cursor, you know, at the right uh-huh. place and everything's all aligned and nice. And what they found was that the, the text was rendered, it was misaligned, 
The, yeah. the, the cursor was blinking somewhere else. It was very strange. It was inexplicable. And this happened to a couple people. They'd make some, and, and it was this weird phenomenon where they'd say, oh, I, you know, I'm making some unrelated change, completely unrelated to the, to the text box. Uh, and then I'd, you know, run ensemble and the text would be all screwed up. Like, okay. how could my change possibly have, have, have done that? And so they'd undo their change and recompile and the problem would go away. Mm -hmm. And then they'd put their change back in and recompile and the problem was not there. Mm -hmm. But it was completely reproducible, right? So if they had a binary where they had this problem, you could kill it and rerun the binary. The exact same problem would occur. And we we're looking at this. It's like, why is this? It's like, well, have you tried to debug build? It's like, yeah, sure. I recompiled for debugging. The problem went away, right? And this happened a couple of times. It's like, what are we going to do about this? And so we were aware that this was a phenomenon. And actually, this is, I remember working with Kevin Rushforth on this. Kevin Rushforth is still yeah. working on the FX. Yeah. yeah, he and I, he and I had a lot of, of fun trying to figure this out. Um, but anyway, so it came time to ship the release and we, we were aware of this phenomenon. And it's like, you know, what if this happens? It's like, we don't know what's going on. Well, what if it happens with our release candidate? It's like, well, no, I guess, you know, what are we going to do about it? I don't know. I mean, we, we don't know what's causing it, so we can't prevent it. So. Well, and you shipped with, uh, no. with debug settings, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, wait for it. Time went on. We were aware of this bug. Came time to do the release. The release candidate build had this bug in it. And it's like, all right, we are really in trouble now. Yeah. What do we do? Well, if we recompile, maybe it'll go away. Uh, like, you know, So, so, so basically we, it was, it was an interesting point because all most development had stopped because we were through release candidate phase. So we had a, mm -hmm. we had a fair amount of time and it's like, you know, and I remember talking to Kevin about this and he and mm -hmm. I had the same attitude. It's like, we, we knew we had been avoiding this problem for a long time and we were hoping it wouldn't go away, but it's like, we have to do something about this now. There's, there's, okay. there's a serious bug in the product and it's our release candidate. So obviously we can't ship this. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Well, let's figure it out. Right. And so we, you know, And, and, you know, people tried debug builds and they couldn't figure it out. So it's like there's clearly something about this binary mm -hmm. that that had a problem. And so people were debugging at the the assembly level, trying to figure out what the problem was and whatnot. And, you know, they weren't getting anywhere with it. And I remember having a conversation with Kevin and it's like we were running out of ideas. And it's like, you know, it's always the last refuge of of the, you know, the unskilled programmer to to blame the compiler, but maybe it's a compiler bug. Like, yeah, yeah, maybe. And I said, well, how, how can we test this? All right. How about this? Write a script that just compiles the class library a hundred times and then just archives the, the, the class file. And let's just look at them and see, see what the results are. See if they're the same. And Kevin, Kevin said, Oh, sure. That, that'd be pretty easy to do. And, I don't have any better ideas, so why not try it? So like an hour later, he comes back and he has this grin on his face. He says, <laughs> that's amazing. Okay, we have 100 binaries. Every binary is different from every other binary. And three of them have this bug. That, that, that's incredible, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so now we have evidence. We have a problem. Okay, so this is, this is, this is, so this is the first piece of evidence that shows us that there's something going on and it's pointing at the compiler. And what's the problem? Well, so, so this is an interesting, interesting, uh, tangle between the language and the language runtime. So you remember, if you're familiar with FX, remember the, the, uh, um, the bind keyword. Yeah. Right. For, so this yeah. is a mm -hmm. feature of, of FX, but, but the, you know, At, over time, I decided that bind is, is actually a very bad idea. Yeah. Because what it does is it propagates side effects. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems is that, um, it's very easy to have. Okay. So when you, when you, when you write a bind expression, you're saying this variable depends on those other variables. Mm -hmm. And so what you do is you're, you're creating a dependency graph in your program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's extremely difficult. To keep track of what depends on what. But it was reactive. Yeah. What I remember back then, I used this to explain reactive programming. Because ah. what you what you could do with JavaFX, you could mm -hmm. say A plus B 
is C. And if you modify A or B, right. the uh, entire expression gets re uh, reevaluated, and you get you know the the result. So it was actually reactive back then. Yeah, that's that's one way to look at it. Uh, except that the bind bind was kind of a a, <laughs> a pull dependency instead of a push yeah. dependency. But yeah, but but yeah, it so worked from from as a user for me. It was push. Maybe okay. it was in, inside pull. But uh, for me, it was actually beautiful because. You could uh, have, ex uh, and you know what we did with it? A really advanced um, input validation. Because yeah. you could say, you know, if you have a form and you can say username and password, so you, you, what we said in Pascal, so you can do there, so you can have pretty complex, you know, uh, in input validation just with the bindings. Because you can say button enabled when username and password not blank. Yeah. The only well, thing, I, the yeah. only thing was the node was weird, so it it came late, uh, last or something like this. But um, for you no, know, as an input validation, it was genius back then. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah, it was definitely very convenient. Um, yeah, yeah, convenient. You know, yeah, uh, well, it it sort of made sense, right? So so yeah, so you have your input validation and you write an expression that that generates a boolean that says whether or not it's valid. And then and, and it binds it automatically to you know to the button whether the uh, login button is enabled or disabled. So you it, right. there is no mediator pattern, nothing. So you so you just you know you have uh, you just saying uh, and this was actually very. The next thing was it was really easy to unit test because you could replace the button. You remember with boolean something boolean property I think was the name. Oh. And and you could uh, and you could actually write a beautiful unit test because uh, you could say okay this and this and this and this if this or all, all conditions are met this should be true or false, and without that the input validation was very complex because it was like the mediator pattern like you know a class, and everyone talked to the class and the class had to to, to know about the state of the component, and so this is actually. Uh, we use a lot this in enterprise projects for input validation, and it worked really well. It was very simple and uh, readable. Yeah, and so that that was the that was the example of bind. Uh, yeah. That I mean, I think it was, I think that's what. I, sorry, that's the motivating example of bind. Uh, mm -hmm. And things like that, it worked pretty well. Um, but I think the problem is that people. Well, I'm not actually sure what the problem is. One of the problems was that that people people wrote stuff that was too complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and so, quick digression: we had a bug. We had a bug in the um, in one of our one of our UI components, and we asked the compiler guys to look at it. And uh, actually, it's interesting. All these guys who are still around now. So uh, Robert Field, who's the developer uh -huh. of JShell, he uh -huh. was working on the, the FX script compiler at the time. And I'm a little ashamed to say that he he had to debug our code for us, uh -huh. <laughs> which was he, he basically you know we said hey we think there's a compiler bug this doesn't this doesn't evaluate correctly, and he must have spent hours on this. But he sent this gigantic email, which was, okay, here's what's going on in your program, <laughs> right? This depends on this, and this depends on this, and, oh, this, okay. depends on this, and this depends yeah. on this. And he says, the problem is, this, this here depends on the evaluation order of those two other things that are also dependent on those other things over there. Mm -hmm. And this is unspecified. And depending on which evaluation order is taken, if, if, if this is evaluated before that, your program works. But if that is valued before this, then your program breaks. Okay. Here's what you should do. You should rewrite your expression to such and so, such and so. So you refactored them to remove the, the ambiguity. So it's like, on the one hand, wow, I'm, I'm sorry to Robert that, that we made him debug our program for us. But there's also an interesting thing going on with the programming language. You can easily write expressions that you don't know what's going on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So back, to my, back to my war story, right? So, but because I think it's related, right? Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we had a situation where the compiler was not giving us reproducible results. And in fact, mm -hmm. it, was, it was giving us different results every single time. Mm -hmm. And so we went to the compiler guys with this and there was some back and forth. And one of the compiler guys, he replaced a hash set with a linked hash set. Okay. And the, and the problem went away. <laughs> Very good. So we clearly have an order dependency yeah. of some sort, mm -hmm. but I don't know if the problem was in the in the in the FX compiler code, or the or whether the problem was um, <clears throat> it was in the um, 
it was something that like Robert Field had diagnosed on this other bug, which was maybe we had written a program that had an inadvertent dependency on the evaluation order of things. Mm -hmm. And combined with the non-reproducibility of of the, the compiled code, we were rolling the dice and, you know, we were rolling the dice every time we compiled and we, you know, we had a 3% chance of getting the wrong answer. What I suspected, some, some you know, concurrency issues inside the compiler or JavaFX, this was my, my suspicion. No, no, what, what, no. Okay, interesting. No, I think it's, I think, I think it's because, um, it, it was uh, so 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 okay. But so if it, you if, no, if you if you have vacations, you could just you know pick the old code and try to find the problem right now, right? Just for fun. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> oh man, right? Yeah. So it's 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 interesting because with a hash set and a linked hash set, right? So the mm -hmm. you know as you know a linked hash set is is well defined. Um, uh, uh, typically insertion order. Whereas a hash set is is in some order based on the hash code, and the hash code, if you don't override hash code, then the the default hash code is the identity hash code, which differs from run to run. And so, is hash set run, ordered? No. Well, sorry. If you iterate a hash set, you yeah. get the you you get the elements in some order. Yeah. And that order in some is order. Mm -hmm. by the hash code and what bucket okay. sends. You, but it's but it's okay. not well defined. But the other thing is that if if your if your object has not overridden hash code, yeah. then it's the system's identity hash code, which does differ from run to run. Yeah, and so uh, because I think it's seeded from the time or something like that, right? Yeah, and so this is a source of of randomness in ordering. Yeah, so if you recompile, you get different identity hash codes, and things mm -hmm. end up in your hash set in a different order. Yeah, but this is simple. Why why it took so long in order to find that problem? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, so so the problem is we actually don't know what the problem is. Yeah, so, sure. So, but what but, I suspect, you know, in the entire expression engine, uh, you use the hash set, and there was some, you know, uh, random random source, and it and it worked, you know, what is that? Three percent of the time, uh, three percent of the time, there were there was some problem, and and the other case, it just worked well. But uh, interesting story, actually, a really interesting story, right? And um, what interests me right now. How much pressure from you know management was there with the with with this project? Was it like not noticed, or you get already you no know, management attention with that? Was Jonathan Schwartz on the floor and asking, you know, what what's oh. what's the deal with that? Uh, not in this particular. Actually, things were pretty calm at this one. This was mostly the engineers talking it over. Oh, okay. Uh, so this was this was good. I mean, uh, I just I just remember the interaction with Kevin because I like working with Kevin. I still do because uh, mm -hmm. he's. Still He's still on the team, but I, I remember, you know, it's like, you know, just this, just sort of the the revelation, right? So the, yeah. the compiler is producing is is producing different results every time, and that's not necessarily a bug, right? If yeah. the compiler produce, you know, there there was basically it was it was it, it could have been, you know, the only differences could have been a permutation of of the code in a class file, yeah. and that should not have any behavioral difference, no. but Apparently, that was causing my, and this is only conjecture because we never got to the bottom of that. Yeah. My, my conjecture is that it changed the eval, in 3% of those cases, the evaluation order was different. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that was a be, because of a bug in the, in the FX UI component code or whether it was actually a bug in the compiler. And so okay. I, at the time, I said, okay, it's very interesting and telling that switching from a hash set to a linked hash set made the problem go away. Mm -hmm. But, we still don't know exactly what the problem is, right? We may yeah. have just fixed the symptom, but we never, I mean, the problem is, you know, FX was essentially, it wasn't really canceled, but it was, it was reset. So it wasn't too long after that, that we, we did the whole thing to rewrite it in Java. Yeah. And so all of that code went away. Okay. So, and, but, and you um, uh, kept doing JavaFix at Oracle, or was it, uh, was it, was JavaFix canceled entirely b before that? Well, it wasn't really, okay, so, so. So what happened was, you know, at a certain point, you know, there, I think, I think there was a, you know, we'd successfully delivered release of Java FX that used Java FX script as the mm -hmm. implementation language, but mm -hmm. it was becoming increasingly clear that that was a barrier to, um, it was barrier to adoption because people had to write a different programming language yeah. and it was a maintenance burden because we had to maintain a compiler and, and a runtime mm -hmm. or a different mm -hmm. language than, than we wanted. Mm -hmm. And so, so at a certain point, um, 
the FX team made the decision to rewrite everything in pure Java instead of, and basically mm-hmm. design Java F, FX script out. Mm-hmm. And, and that was, that was at the point where I left the team and actually joined the JDK group proper. Okay. And this was before the Oracle acquisitions? It was, I think it was, it was actually at about the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember. Actually, no. So my official, my official job transfer was after the acquisition because, um, okay. It was, it was, you know, it was 2010 or so. <laughs> so then, uh, suggestion. I would like to reinvite you back and just talk about <laughs> proper Java, just about Java, no more history, you know, about just JEPs and deprecation, of course, deprecation first and then new stuff, right? Uh, yeah, so this is good. I think uh, I was thinking the same thing. We've been on for a while, and this is a good stopping point. But also, you see a lot of foreshadowing here, right? This, yeah. this whole it's about languages, libraries, and evaluation order. Yeah, right. All of those things are still in play. And list <laughs> and last in lists, right? Uh, first yeah. and last in lists. This is what I want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. Very good. Um, where people can find you on Twitter, your blog, maybe, or ah, uh, Twitter is probably the best place. Uh, mm-hmm. at Stuart Marks on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think there's a link to my blog from there. I don't blog very often, but there's some, there's some, uh, occasionally I'll write an interesting article. Blog okay. on WordPress. Thank you. All right. Good to talk to you, Adam. And, uh, you, it was fun uh, for me. I really enjoy, you know, I really enjoy the conversation about old time Sun Microsystems because, uh, from outside, it was a little bit of mystery. So it is all, yeah. always, you know, nice to know what happened inside. Yeah. I enjoy sharing it. Thank you. Okay. Well, we'll talk again. I guess. Well, we'll we'll schedule it again for yeah. sometime in the future. Okay. Bye.